So if you have been here, then you know we've been studying through Colossians. And if you haven't been here, well, now you know that we've been studying through Colossians. So today we are in Colossians 2, 13 through 15. If, every, if everyone would like to turn there, honestly, I have no idea what page it's on. I know. I, I try. What? Three eighty. Oh, is it? I don't. I don't know how far these probably go. Eight hundred five. Oh. You were only five hundred. Hey, I don't. I don't know how far these Bibles go, man. <laughs> what? Okay, so Colossians two thirteen through fifteen. It starts out when you were dead in your sins. And in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. Then it continues in, in verse 14. Having canceled the charge of our legal in, indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. In verse 15, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So let's look back at verse 13. What does verse 13 tell you? It tells us a few things. Number one, it tells us we were dead in our sins. That's the key word. Were, meaning past tense. So before we knew Christ, or before we know Christ, we are dead in our sins. But what exactly does being dead in your sins mean? Does anyone know? Or I could take a guess. Emmy. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yep, correct. To be dead in your sins means to be spiritually dead. And spiritually dead also means to be blinded from the glory of Christ God. We are as dead to spiritual truth as a human corpse is dead to being touched. Now, what exactly does spiritually dead mean? It simply means to be separated from God. In Colossians 1, verse 21, it puts it in another way and says to be alienated from God. So we are before Christ. So being dead in your sins means to be far from or away from or separated from God. But here's another question. Why should we care that we are separated from God? Why, why does that matter? Why does it matter to you? Nathan got some answer I heard. It's okay. Okay. Is that, that's the, oh, got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Emmy? Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. What I have here is, first, God is our creator. So to be separated from the one that created you and the rest of the universe sounds awful. Second, the Bible says in 1 John 4, Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. And if God is love, then imagine how much you're missing out on. The, the love you think you have now is nothing compared to the love that the Lord has for you. And third, God invites us into a life where we can live with him for eternity. And without him, 
Without this life, we are doomed. If we move on in verse 13, it says you are uncircumcised in your flesh. Does anyone know what being uncircumcised in your flesh means? Or if you had to guess, yeah, go for it. Okay. 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 No, that that's fair. It's on the right track. You just went opposite. You said not good, and you said not bad. Oh, <laughs> anyone else? What does being uncircumcised in your flesh mean? This is the same principle as being dead in your sin. It means to be living in sin or one who breaks the law. So to look back at verse 13, we were separated from God and spiritually dead. And you were living in sin because of this. Now, if we look at the last little bit of verse 13, it says, God has made you alive with Christ and he forgives you all of your sins. When we are united with Christ, his punishment becomes ours. His righteousness becomes ours. And God counts our sin against us no more. God made us alive together with him because our sins are forgiven. He makes us eternally alive. We are no longer a corpse that can't be touched by spiritual reality. We now see Christ for who he is. And because of this, we are called to live a new life. We see that in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. It says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. And as we move into verse 14, it says, He has canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Verse 14 starts out telling us that He, God, has canceled our legal indebtedness, something we owe, something we rightfully deserve to be punished for because we've done it to ourselves. But God canceled it. Though that's not the end of verse 14. It tells us he canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which also stood against us and condemned us. So he didn't just cancel it, but he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. God sent his son Jesus to earth to live as a human. But Jesus had to give up his divine powers so that he could live a life like any of us. He was tempted to do the same things and tempted in all the same ways to fall into sin. Yet, he never did. He lived a perfect, sinless life, consistently loving and serving others. He lived this life to then die on the cross for the penalty of our sins, all because of his great love. God took our sins and nailed it to him, having him pay the punishment for our sins. But through Christ, we are forgiven and can have eternal life in him. As we continue in this life, God calls us to a life of no worry, a life of love no matter the situation, a life of forgiveness. As we look at verse 15, it says, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he has made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So in other words, God made the powers and authorities useless. He made a public fool slash putting them to shame by 
by defeating them on the cross. Now, this isn't talking about earthly powers and authorities, but talking about spiritual powers and authorities. Ephesians 6.12 says, For our, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of the dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. What does it mean that the powers and authorities have been disarmed? You say something? Okay. Okay, yeah. Yep. If we look at the word disarmed, it means to be stripped. So in verse 15, as you think of Jesus being stripped down and put on the cross, many thought he had lost, that he couldn't be what he said. But really what's happening is the opposite. Satan and his demonic forces were being stripped and put to shame. We see that Satan can do a lot of damage. And if you know the story of Job, then you know the pain that the devil put him through. But if you don't know the story, then it tells us that about Satan asking permission from God to harm Job. God tells him that he can touch his family, his livestock, and his servants. He can do anything he wants except damage Job physically. So here we see that Satan has boundaries. He is still under God. And by God sending Jesus to die on the cross, Satan can do nothing to you. For you are no longer bound by sin if you go to the Lord. You are no longer condemned. He can no longer hold us to unforgiven sins if we are in Christ. Because through Christ, we are forgiven. And because of this, he can't scare us with death any longer. Christ has beaten death by being a sacrifice on the cross and then raising it from the dead three days later. So let's recap real quick. Number one, we were spiritually dead and living in the uncircumcision of our flesh. Number two, God has made us alive if we believe in what Jesus did, that he was a sacrifice to take the penalty of our sins, that he forgives us and makes a way so we can have eternal life through him. Number three, God has canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness through Christ on the cross. And that Christ has defeated death once and for all, stripping Satan of any hold he can have on us. But like I've been saying throughout this whole thing, Christ has died for us because God has, or because God gave us a different way of life. Again, we see that in 2 Corinthians 5.17. It tells us that if you are in Christ, then you are a new creation. It tells us that the old is gone. You are no longer bound by the way of your old life. You are called to be new. But when we think of a new life, what does a new life look like? What does a new life look like? Okay, yeah. If you had to change your life right now, what would that look like for you? Okay, yeah. Living a new life 
we are called to repent, meaning turn from our sins. Not just say, I'm done doing this, but it's truly turning away from them. Acts 20, 21 says, I've declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. Living a new life, we are called to love. And this is also on your handout. It is your first fill in the blank spot. So living a new life, we are called to love. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 6 says, Love is patient, love is kind. Love does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does, it does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It, keep, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always hopes, always perseveres. And this will be the next blank. Living a new life, we are called to be like Christ. We are called to be like Christ. Philippians 2, 5 through 10 says, In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equally with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. Now, if you would pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you uh, for the opportunity that you have given me uh, specifically to be up here, uh, to get to uh, preach your word. Uh, I want to thank you for everyone that's in this room. Uh, for I am a little sick, and I know there's sickness going around with some of our other leaders. I, first of all, pray for them, uh, asking for healing. But I'm also thankful that we have enough leaders still to have youth group. I pray that you spoke to the, everyone's hearts in this room, mine, the leaders, all the children. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.